Last week we began to talk about giants and overcoming the giants that are in our lives. And uh, last week I took a survey and asked how many people have some giants in their lives and everyone then put up their hand. Do we still have some giants that uh, you're dealing with? Okay, so this is still a relevant message this week. That's good. I want to be relevant. It's important for us to, to know that there are giants that we need to deal with. Now, I want to say something. This is really, really important. We're not in this alone. We need to understand that Jesus has defeated the greatest giant of all, and that was Satan, and he defeated him on the cross of Calvary. And so I don't want you to think that somehow we're, we're struggling to, to beat giants up that haven't been defeated already. They have been defeated. In other words, the price has been paid for their defeat. It's like you've been equipped with the ammunition or what, what the tools that you need to completely push that enemy away from you. You have that ability in Christ Jesus. And so it's important to realize that this isn't about you so much. It's about Christ in you and allowing him to show you the victory that you already have in him. Amen? And so we're going to be talking about one of the uh, greatest enemies of all, the, the fear of, uh, the giant of fear. But before we do that, if you remember last week, we, we talked about our origins. We, we began to build a foundation. And I talked about the fact that, that each one of us have been anointed, that each one of us have been sealed, that each one of us have the Holy Spirit in us. And that's just so important. And that word anointing, for those that maybe you weren't here last week or didn't hear the message, it, it literally means to be smeared or to be rubbed on. It, and, and we looked at the story of David when he was anointed by Samuel the prophet. And literally, he had oil dumped on him, probably like a half a gallon of oil, and, and it was rubbed all over him. And, and, and literally, it was an experience that David had, wasn't it? And that's what I wanted you to understand last week, that the anointing of God is more than just, oh, okay, I'm anointed of God. It's, it's, it's more than a confession. It's an experience in God. And if you haven't had that experience, don't think, oh, well, I guess this is not going to happen to me. Or I guess that's not for me. That's crazy talk. All right, listen to me. That's crazy talk. Because God wants you to have encounters with him. Don't let any teaching, false teaching, or, or people who say that God doesn't move today, don't let their deceptive teachings hold you back from everything that God's got for you. And he wants you to experience him. Just as Jesus experienced feelings on this earth as a perfect human being, we are called to experience the presence of God in our lives. And if you're not, or maybe you haven't for some time, ask him. It's just simple. Lord, I just want to spend time with you. I want to experience you in my life once again. I need to, again, just, just renew my relationship with you. Ask him. Seek him. He is there for each and every one of us. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, he shall rescue. We just sang a song called Rescue, you know, and, and the point is he is there for you. And so that's what that anointing is. And then it went on, we talked about you've been sealed. That literally means that God has marked you. You are a marked man, a marked woman by him. You know, again, we think, you know, marked for death. We think marked for, you know, bad things to be marked. This is a good kind of marking. It's the kind of mark that when God looks down from heaven, he says, that's one of mine. That's one of mine. Because that mark, that seal is on you. And then finally, the third part we looked at last week is that you have been anointed, you have been sealed because you have the Holy Spirit. And that's the most important thing of all, right? You have the presence of God living in you. And, and we looked at that word a little bit and, and we learned that that literally means the supernatural. Literally, you are superhuman. You know, we kind of had some fun looking at some of the superheroes that are around, you know, that you see in, in uh, the movies and such. And the thing is, literally, you are are better equipped and stronger than any of the best of those. You just need to understand that, that you have available through the presence of God, through the Holy Spirit, the more power, the fact, the same power, listen to this, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That's straight from Scripture. Think about that. The same power that put life back into a dead body is in dwelling inside of you. And that's the foundation that each and every one of us have to have in order to defeat any giants in our lives. We need to know that we're anointed. We need to know that we're sealed. We need to know that the Holy Spirit is in us so that we can go out. They're not, we're not doing it in our own strength. That we're doing it because of Christ living in us. Amen? And so with that, I want to deal with probably one of the greatest giants of all that we will deal with in our lives. And that's the giant of fear. 
You know, you could have phobias of different things, you know, like, you know, some people are afraid of spiders. They see a spider, it doesn't matter how small it is and how far away it is. If they see a spider, they freak out right away, all right? Don't show me your hand if you're one of those people, all right? Uh, you know, snakes for some people, mice for other people, insects of any sort for other people. Do you know that there's phobias about even walking on the grass and barefoot? That just freaks out some people. You know, there, there's, there's phobias of, of elevators, of stairways, of, of heights, of depths. You know, the list goes on and on where, where fear can grip your life. And I believe that God has a prescription for us to deal with the giant of fear. And, and we're going to see that before we get to the end of today. But we've been using the story of David, David and Goliath specifically as our foundation of we've been, as we've been looking at the giants in our lives. And so I would ask that you'll turn to, uh, back to Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm just going to look here at some scriptures and, and begin to build a platform to jump out from. And I mean that metaphorically. We're not doing any bungee jumping here, so no one run out in fear, okay? We're not, we're not doing that. 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 4. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor, and he had bronze armor on his legs, and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel, and he said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Have you, am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So as we look at this account, here we have the description of this giant that is facing uh, the Israelite army, and he's massive. You know, the, the measurements there uh, is equivalent to nine feet, nine inches. Can you imagine? You know, this from the floor to the ceiling is 11 foot four. So you can imagine the guy, you know, he could reach up and touch the ceiling just from the ground. You know what I'm saying? This guy is giant. You know, the armor that he's wearing weighs 125 pounds. That's just the armor. The javelin, when they talked about that, that on the end of it, the, the head of the javelin, weighed 15 pounds. And a weaver's beam is about two inches thick. So you can imagine the guy's got like a tree. You know what I'm saying? He's holding his tree with his weight on the end of it. And he can hurl this thing at people. Can you imagine? That I don't even know how anyone could even get near him. He could probably take that thing and just, just poke him around and nobody could even get close to him. This guy was incredible. You know, he was like better than any wrestler you've seen on television, better than any superhero you've seen. The guy was amazing. So just his, the sight of this guy had to be terrified. And so as we look, we see that it was because when we look at verse 11, it says, when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. In fact, if you jump down to verse 24, it, just, it says this as well to add to it because he comes out 40 days and keeps saying this, come out, come out, come out. And, and it says in verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So you see a progression here. Back to verse 11, if you could. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. That word dismayed literally means to become broken down or confused. Literally it means that, you know, that they, they knew what they were there to do and all of a sudden as this Philistine began to talk, all their thoughts got all muddled up and they just, ah, what do we do? What do we do? And, and it says to become greatly afraid. That, that word afraid literally means to become paralyzed with fear. We're not talking about, yeah, I'm a little afraid to drive a car on the interstate, or I'm a little afraid to do this, or a little afraid to do that. Uh, you hear what I'm going. This literally was to such a fear that, and I've seen this happen, I've only had it happen to me a couple times in my life, where literally 
your, everything seizes up. You can't move. You can't talk. You, you, you can't do it. You're literally just frozen. And literally, that's what this word means in the original Hebrew. They were frozen in fear. And then as we read verse uh, 24, it says that as they heard him and saw him, that they fled. So after that initial shock, what did they do? Turned tail and ran, okay? In other words, after they were able to uh, get feeling back in their legs, they, they hightailed it and ran away. And literally, that's what the enemy wants to do, especially a spirit of fear in our lives, is that he wants to come and, and so intimidate you to cause you to become paralyzed in your thinking, your actions, just, just how, how to view things to such a point that you run away and hide. Now, here's the thing. With some of the fears in our lives, we can do that, can't we? You know, if you have a phobia of riding in elevators, let me tell you, you probably got an apartment where there's no elevator. There's only stairs. So you don't have to worry about the elevator because there isn't one there. You hear where I'm going? Because heaven forbid if the stairs were blocked and you had to take the elevator, you'd rather die than do that. You hear where I'm going? So what you do is you avoid things. You know, spiders, okay, you have a, the uh, Terminator guy come and you tell him you kill anything that moves and is alive in my house. And, and you have him come every month. You, you get what I'm saying? You don't want to see any creepy crawly things that even resembles a spider. So what, what are you doing in a sense? You're not facing it really. You're managing it. You're managing that giant of fear that's in your life. And here's the problem. When you manage giants of fear in your life, then they're just going to keep taunting you. Just as they did the children of Israel for 40 days. He just kept coming out saying, I defy you. You know, who's going to fight me? Nobody's going to fight me. Who do, you can't fight me. I'm bigger than all of you. You see, that's what your giant of fear is saying to you all the time. But you've got to come to a place of overcoming that. I watched a, a clip of uh, Miracle on the Hudson. Has anyone seen that movie? Uh, it starred uh, Tom Hanks. Remember when uh, he, he was, uh, the guy, the real pilot was uh, Sully, or Sullenberger was the guy's name. It was in 2009, he, was, he took off from LaGuardia Airport, and he hit a bunch of Canadian geese. Listen, don't blame me for that, all right? Just hit, hit a flock of Canadian geese that went through both the engines, both engines cut. And so here he is, he's, he, he's still going forwards, and so he talks to the tower, says, look at our, our engines are out. And they said, well, why don't you just turn around and come back? He says, well, we don't have any engines at all. And so they tried to work out a way literally within seconds to land at some other airport. And he realized he didn't have enough altitude to be able to come in because basically an airplane is a giant paperweight unless it can move forward. And the only way it can move forward is to keep the nose down so it can glide. And so he knew he had literally not many seconds to figure out what he was going to do. So he circled around and landed. The only place in the city where you can land a giant aircraft, you know, there's no street you can land it on, it is right in the Hudson River. And, and I actually watched the video of the original landing. It was awesome. Man. Guy brought in such a gentle, he brought in just perfect, came in. But they were showing, in the movie, they were showing what was happening inside. So obviously, he brought the plane in, it was all nice, and, and, just, and water starts coming in, right? And everyone's like, ah, you know, they're all freaking out. And he says, look at everyone, calm down. The guy, you know, he'd been a pilot for 29 years. Before that, he was a military pilot. So he just, he was the calm in the storm, in a sense. And he's telling everybody, okay, slowly exit the plane. And as they're going out, there's literally some people in their seats couldn't move. They're literally, they're grabbing the sides of the seats, and they're paralyzed with fear. Even though the exit doors were open, you know, out onto the wings. They weren't really in any immediate danger. Yet in their minds, they're like, I'm going to die. You, you, you hear what I'm saying? They, they were just so frozen in fear that literally other people had to come along, pry their hands off the seat, and literally carry them out because they were so frozen, paralyzed in fear. Other people, when they got out on the wings, instead of waiting, they were so freaked out, they jumped in the water. Water was 36 degrees. Thank God that there was enough people around, enough boats that came quickly enough, not of the 155, not one perished. Not one. Can you imagine that? And so when you think about that, first of all, you had all the stewardesses and the stewards that did their job. You had a pilot and a co-pilot that kept their calm in the midst of a fearful situation. And then finally, you had enough people that were able to not allow a spirit of fear to control them to be able to help those who had a spirit of fear. Which group are you in? Don't show me your hands. You hear where I'm going? If you were on that plane, and they're saying, you know, duck, 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 and you, know, and you realize you're, you're going down, 
Are, would you be screaming, frozen? Or would you be like, hey, Jesus, this is not the ride I was planning, but I know you're with me, and I'm trusting you. Which, which one would you be? You can't answer that. I can't answer that. You know why? Until you are facing one of those giants in your life, you don't know what's going to happen. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. You see, so often we pray, hey, Jesus, take this away. I got this going. I got this fear thing that's happening. Just take it away. And the Lord's looking down and said, take it away? Why would I do that? You're like, please, 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 this is driving me. He's like, why would I take it away? You've got to face this thing. You've got to deal with this thing. I've paid the price for you to defeat it. Now you need to step up to the plate and you need to sling the stone and you need to knock that thing down. See, if you're begging God to take things away from your life and you're wondering why God's not answering, because you're not praying the word. I never saw anywhere in scripture where God cried retreat, ever. There's no place in the Bible, not one place. Not one place. But I see everywhere where God says, rise up. I see everywhere where we're to face the giants that are in our lives. And when you begin to pray that way, instead of, Lord, take this away, but rather, Lord, how do I deal with this giant? What do I do? How do I, how do I overcome? Then God can begin to speak and give you a strategy to overcome. So how did David, and we read about this last week, so we're not going to read this, how did David face that Goliath that was like three times taller than him, better equipped than him, how did David defeat Goliath? In my Bible, I'm going to turn the page. But in your app or whatever, you're, you're going to move your finger somehow, all right? So if you go to 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 32. So just to give you a little context, uh, Goliath hasn't been beaten yet. Uh, here's what happens. David hears about what's going on, and he goes to King Saul. And so this is the conversation that he has. So 1 Samuel 17, verse 32. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, meaning Goliath. Your servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go out against this Philistine to fight him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock... I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he would deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So what was David's point of strength? It had nothing to do with the size of Goliath. You see, for you and I sometimes, we're looking at what we're fearful of and we're like, man, that is just too big. You're looking at the wrong thing. We need to be looking at Jesus and saying, he's really big. And he's bigger than any of the giants that are in your life. See, you're looking at the wrong thing. And that's why David had the faith to overcome Goliath. He wasn't looking at the strength of Goliath. In fact, his attitude was, what's the big deal? I've killed the lion, killed the bear. He's just like one of those. Just a two-legged version, that's all. No big deal. In other words, he didn't see it as a problem. Why? Because he had had private victories. He had had victories over other giants in his life. See, and that's what I'm talking about, that if you've got these big giants in your life, and you're like, God, take this away, take this away, it could be that you're not yet ready to face that giant yet. But there's some other giants you need to deal with. And as you grow in faith and wisdom to deal with those giants, you know, the lions and the bears, then you'll be able to deal with the giants of Goliath that are in your life. You hear where I'm going with this? So it's just so, so important that you don't run away from any of the confrontations that God has called you to. There are more than one giant in your life. You know, I'm not here to be a Debbie Downer on you, but listen, you got more than one giant. That's just the way it is. It's called life, all right? We're facing these things all of the time, and we have to realize that. And, and we're going to have more giants. You've got giants you don't even know about, but here's the thing. Those giants you don't know about, you already have the victory in Christ. You just got to walk in it. 
And so in preparation for that, God will allow you to encounter smaller giants in your life. And I thank God that the word says that no temptation has seized us except for that which is common to man. God is faithful to not allow us to be tempted or tested above what we can stand, but God will provide a way for us that we can get out from underneath it. Point being that God is there for you through this. Everyone with me on this? This is so important. Now, this all sounds good. In other words, great. David had the, the back pasture field. Uh, he could practice slinging his stones. He could, he could, you know, real lions or real bears came out of the, the woods and he was able to attack them. I am not suggesting that we go into the hills of Montana or something. You hear where I'm going and, and be shepherds for a couple of years and, and learn how to defeat, you know, bears and lions. That, that isn't going to work for us, right? Yet the principles work. And so that's what I love about the Bible. It always has the answer. So we've seen, in a sense, the, uh, an outline of, of giants that are in our lives, how, how fear can rise up and how to defeat it in, in a war-type situation. But for you and I, I have yet to meet a Goliath, a physical Goliath. I haven't met anyone that tall yet. Yet each one of us have these giants, especially the fear giants. How are we to beat this giant of fear today. What's, what's the practical steps for this? Well, we have a prescription in the Bible that tells us. So if you have your Bibles, hop over to 2 Timothy. This will be our last scripture for today because it's, it's really, really, really good. Now here the Apostle Paul is speaking to Timothy and he's encouraging Timothy and he gives Timothy a prescription to deal with fear. And I believe this applies for you and I today, amen? Okay, so 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. It says, when I call to remember it, the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you, Timothy, to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. And so here we have literally the formula for us to overcome fear in our lives. So it begins with what? If you look back, the Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy, hey, your grandmother and your mom, they had genuine faith. So in other words, the ability to trust who? Trust God. In other words, that is the first and foremost important part that you need to begin this victory walk, so to speak. You need to have faith. Now, you might say, well, I haven't got any faith. Well, you do. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can note this one scripture, Romans 12, verse 3, and it says this, that God has given each one of us a measure of faith. So you might say, well, I haven't got it. God gave you some. Just take it, grow it. In fact, I've heard people say that it's like seed faith. He's given you a measure of it, an amount that you can take, and you can grow it. It's like a seed. And so how did David grow his faith? He beat up lions and bears. That was his way of dealing with it, all right? So in our case, we're dealing with some of the different phobias that are in our lives. In fact, even if you look to the world and you look at psychologists, psychiatrists, what they say in dealing with different phobias, you know what they all say? Avoidance will not fix the problem. You have to begin to face it. All of them say that. It actually lines up with the scriptures, all right? You have to face these things. There's just no way around it. All right, so it begins with faith. All right, then it goes on and says that, that uh, God hasn't given us, what, a spirit of fear. So this fear thing, this giant of fear is literally a spirit that can come on you. That's why your mind just goes crazy because literally it's something that comes on you and tries to overcome you. And God hasn't given us that. What spirit has he given us, though? He's given us the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says this, that the one that is in you is greater than the one that's in the world. That's from 1 John. 1 John in chapter 4, actually. And so we have the Holy Spirit in us, yet the enemy wants to put his spirit, small as his spirit of fear upon you. Who are you going to let win? Let's let the Holy Spirit win, amen? And not allow that spirit of fear to control us and direct us. And then the next step, it goes on. He says, okay, haven't given you a spirit of fear, but of what? Power 
and then love, and of a sound mind. That word power in the original Greek is dunamis. That's the explosive power of God. That means that the tools that you need to overcome, the weapons in a sense of your warfare. And so literally the dunamis power of God. And then it says love. Now you know what that word love is? It's not the kind of love that, you know, that we have towards maybe one another. The kind of love it's talking about here is the agape kind of love. In fact, it's the only love that God has for us. It's unconditional, no strings attached, all powerful, limitless. And so literally, that's what we have, all right? We have that kind of love. And then it says, and of, what's the last part? How is it worded? Sound mind. Some versions say self-control. Uh, you know, it's worded in different ways. And so literally, here's the order of this. We begin with faith, all right? And with that faith, then we're able to then stir up the gift of God. So how do we stir that up? Some versions say this, to fan into flame the gift that is in us. You see, that is speaking of the Holy Spirit. Remember last week we talked about the importance of this? Let me say something to you before I even go any further. This is a bit of a, a rabbit trail, but I, I want you to hear what I'm going to say. God allows giants in your life that are bigger than you can overcome. And you might say, well, that's not fair. Oh, no. There's a purpose for it. Do you know why God allows that? You see, there's not a giant in your life that God doesn't know about. In fact, the Bible says that nothing happens to you except for what's been filtered through his hands. That's what the scriptures say. In other words, whatever's going on, whether good or bad, God is aware of it. No matter how big that giant is, God knows that it's in your life. And it's probably bigger than you can handle. You know why? Because then you will rely upon him. See, you can't do it on your own. And when you and I come to a place of actually understanding that, instead of struggling and managing these giants that are in our lives, but trusting God to help us, that's when the victory comes. That's why the giants are so darn big. You know, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but most of us, we like little giants. You know why? We can just go and just stomp them out ourselves. You know what I'm saying? We don't, hey, Jesus, I got this one. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But what he does is he allows bigger ones to come in so that we need to rely upon him. And again, not so that he's some kind of tyrant, say, oh, well, you've got to trust. It's not like that at all. It's so that as we reach out to him in faith, we grow in faith then. It's to help us grow. It's not, it's not about him. It's about him helping us become all that we've been called to. That's God's heart for you and I. And so as we go on, th see, this all brings us to power, love, and of a sound mind. Now, look at this. I love how this is worded. In 2 Timothy 1.7, in the NIRV version, I love this. God didn't give us a spirit that makes us weak and fearful. He gives us a spirit that gives us power and love. It helps us control ourselves. You see, as we allow the power of the Holy Spirit in the context of God's love, we're able to keep our heads together. On, uh, in fact, I'm going to show you a, a little video clip in a moment. In fact, uh, we went to a place called uh, a Falls, Cat Catterskill Falls. Anybody been there? All right, got some hands up. Right. Pretty cool, right? Never been there. So on Thursday, some of the guys in the church, we, the ones that had motorcycles, uh, we, we took a drive up on Thursday to Catterskill Falls. And so why don't you run that video if you could, and I'll just describe what's happening there. So in my life, uh, I deal with uh, fear of high places, low places, those kinds of things. So, so there's the, the, the place that you're supposed to go out on to have a look, right? So I'm looking at it saying, whoa, that looks pretty rickety. Anyways, so... So I, so I look at it, and I say, it should be all right. Now, look, I, that's me taking the video, okay? So I am out on that place, and I'm taking the video of it, and it's hundreds of feet down. Like, seriously, it is way down there. And Brian's like, hey, why don't we walk up to the falls and actually see where the water's coming from? So here we go up there, and he's like, hey, why don't we go out over here to the rocks? I'm like, dude, I'm just fine right here. And, and, and while he's describing this, now here's the... He's describing, he's like, yeah, what, what are you, a chicken? And he says, you know, a bunch of people died here, you know, and, and did you know that? And I'm like, oh, thank, thanks, Brian, for that information, you know? <laughs> you know. And I did look it up after, and it is a fact that a whole bunch of people taking selfies and that, lost their footing, plunged to their death. And, and so, so Brian, he's tormenting me a little bit. He's tormenting me a little bit. And you know, those of you that know Brian, he's doing it in fun. But Brian doesn't know my past. 20 years ago, you wouldn't get me near that place. I'd be 100 feet back then, I'm good, I'm good, you go on out there, you go risk your freaking life and, and go hang out there, that, that's up to you, you know, but here's what's happened over the years, 
I've been able to bring my mind into control, to say, hold it. What is rational? What is irrational? First of all, the government is not going to put up a rickety platform with all kinds of lawsuits that will happen, right? And again, I, and as I looked at their eight by eight timbers, you know, it was solid. You know, it, it never moved. You know, you could jump up and down. It wasn't moving. So I had to will myself because on the inside, I've got that fear that's still pushing. And I'm like, no, no, no. So I walk right up the edge. I'm like, okay. Took the video. And then, and then, so here's the deal. Then God probably was using Brian. Brian's like, hey, let's go up this trail. So we go up this trail, and you think, hey, trails through the woods should be safe, right? Well, literally, it's along the edge of the precipice. Like, if you just went one foot off, you're done. Like, tumble down, die. That, that's, you know, don't call the ambulance. You know, just call the mortician. You're done. And so, so I'm walking along. I'm like, gosh, this is scary. You know, in my mind again, what, what, what is happening? I've got this war going on, on the inside. But again, 20 years ago, you wouldn't catch me on that trail. But now I'm doing it. So I get up to the edge, you know, and there's near the edge where I took more video. And like I'm 10 feet from the, from the edge, and I can see it's kind of slimy, and I can see that people could die easily. And like I have no death wish on my life, so I'm in a comfortable place where I am. Now Brian, he's out on the edge. That's just Brian. God bless him. And I prayed for his safety the entire time. But so... But here's the deal. We all deal with different fears, different phobias. For, for some of you, you wouldn't be caught dead doing the stuff that I just did there at that fault. Other people, pff, you got no issue at all. You're like, eh, you know, hanging out on the edge with one foot, you know, dancing along that ridge. You, you would have no issue at all. But here's the thing. That same person that can do that is fearful of a little spider. You get what I'm saying? You, you see where I'm going? Like, the, the kind of fears that you and I deal with are super irrational sometimes. Makes no sense. And so here's the thing. If we will allow faith to rise up in our lives, trust that the Lord has gotten the victory for us, we can overcome. So here's what I want to do just in finishing up right now. And I'm going to add, Lauren, you want to come up? We're going to finish with a song in just a few moments. I want to give you four just, so if you're jotting steps down, four steps based upon what we've just talked about. Just quick steps. Victory over the giant of fear, all right? So here's number one. Okay, number one, stir up the gift. Through faith, stir up the gift of God that is in you. You've got to fan this thing to flame. In other words, you've got to learn to trust God. And for that to happen, there may be some giants you're going to have to deal with, some smaller ones maybe. But as you defeat those ones, You'll be able to deal with the bigger ones in your life. Amen? Okay. The second one. Through faith, exercise the power of the Holy Spirit. You've been given the power of the Holy Spirit in your lives. You know, again, if we want to use the superhero guys as an example, they had to, they had to figure out what they could do, you know? Oh, can I fly? I don't know. So, you know, I had to try. You get what I'm saying? So, what we need to do is utilize what God's given us. And begin to exercise those gifts. And how can we do that? We need to know what the Word says concerning the power of God in us. That, and if the disciples could do it, you know what that means? I have any disciples here? Disciples of Jesus? See, what I love about God is He shows no favoritism. So whatever the disciples could do, what you saw them do in the Bible, guess what you and I can do? The very same things. And Jesus said, even greater things you'll do. Because when those disciples were going about, going around doing things with Jesus, they hadn't even got the dwell, indwelling of the Holy Spirit yet. You know, that new covenant hadn't actually been purchased yet. So we could do greater things than what we see in the Gospels. All right. Third one. Through faith, know that God your Father loves you unconditionally and that He's with you. This is a biggie. Because if you've got fear that's trying to push in on you and you're on the edge of a cliff somewhere, you don't want to think that you're alone. You want to know that God is with you. And as I was near that falls, I knew that Jesus was standing right there with me, 10 feet off the ledge, all right? And I knew he was right there with me. And then the final one, and this is the important one. This is kind of our, the act, action step. Through faith, control your thoughts and emotions so they don't control you. This is just so, so important. And it takes practice you know, I'm sure that when David started slinging stones, I'm sure that he wasn't real accurate when he first started. But he kept slinging stones, kept slinging stones, and, and be, he worked his craft, so to speak. And for you and I, we need to exercise in the realm of the Spirit to be able to overcome the enemies in our life. Amen? Let's stand together. We're going to sing that song, We Get a Victory, right? Did I say it right? Is that the right title? We see a victory. All right. It talks about giants in there. Make it your prayer. Amen?
and then we'll close in prayer at the end. Thank you. Right now, I thank you.
open for every person here right now. And Lord God, fear plays a role in most of our lives at different levels, in different ways. And it's hindering us from all that you have for us. And you allow it in our lives so that we can get the victory and grow in it and through it. So Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, show us our path of victory. Show us what, what we need to do. That Lord, to hide, to flee, to run away, is, or to avoid, is not the answer. But to face these giants of fear in our lives and get the victory. Just like David did. Just like Timothy did. Just like Jesus did. did so all the disciples in the Bible, so have countless millions of others gotten the victory through faith in you, through trusting you. So Lord, give us clear thinking when the spirit of fear tries to rise up against us. That we would operate in the power and love of the Holy Spirit. 